All right, folks, so here we are. We're starting a new, very exciting section, I think, on something called probabilistic PCA. So in this section, we're going to be essentially looking at PCA, which we've now looked at in two different ways before. One as giving us directions of maximum variance, two as directions which, as finding a subspace which we, you know, produces the lowest reconstruction error. We're not gonna be looking at it from a third way. It's gonna from a probabilistic latent variable um, approach. And what's useful about this third way and what, and what makes it not just like yet another way of seeing it is that it allows us to deal with lots of new situations that we couldn't before. And then to also extend this algorithm in ways that um, it was unclear how to do with the with the previous um, heuristic approaches. So he's going to talk about that, and then we'll get into what we mean. Um, you know what we, what we mean exactly. And if you haven't seen, you know, this, you know, I know we jumped to chapter twelve, so you might not have seen this term latent variable model. And it'll become clear what we mean as we go. And this is actually a very nice example of what a latent variable model is. But literally, just means that there are latent just means hidden. So your observations that you've you know recorded, you're going to assume they've actually been produced by some hidden variable that have been transformed in some way. And we'll see why that's, that's going to be useful um, as we go. Okay, so let's just get on to it. So, um, you know, the formulation of PCA discussed in the previous section was based on a linear projection of the data onto a subspace of lower dimensionality than the original data space. So that was kind of the very last thing we talked about. We now show that PCA can also be expressed as the maximum likelihood solution of a probabilistic latent variable model. So let's just highlight that. Okay, cool. This reformulation of PCA, known as probabilistic PCA, brings several advantages compared with conventional PCA. Okay, so now we're going to see like why we, why we might want to look at things this way. Okay, so a constrained form of the Gaussian distribution in which the number of free parameters can be restricted while still allowing the model to capture the dominant correlation of the data set. So we're still going to model our data as being coming from us a multivariate Gaussian, but we're going to be we're restricting the covariance and some of the parameters in that Gaussian so that um, you know, to capture the, the features we're interested in um, and reduce our, you know, reduce the set of parameters we have to deal with. Okay, we can drive an EM algorithm for PCA. Okay, so we haven't talked about EM yet, but whenever you have kind of hidden, hidden variables, missing data, EM is often the go-to algorithm. And all, and all it is is basically an, an approach where at each step, you kind of guess, you make your best guess as to what the values of the the hidden variables are or the missing data and then you use those that guess to update your estimate of the parameters you're interested in and you go back and forth um, and often this is going to produce good results and uh, give you um you know good estimates of your parameters so we'll talk i might i might put a just a you know a, a little one-off mini tutorial on em as we go but anyway either way just think of it as doing maximum likelihood in the setting of latent variables missing observations so we're, we're going to find an em algorithm for pca that is computationally efficient in situations where only a few leading eigenvectors are required, and that avoids having to validate a covariance matrix as an intermediate step. So often, you know, well, you know, sometimes when we're doing this kind of work, we only care about the first few eigenvectors. That can be because maybe the data is noisy and only the first few are going to be really um, have some signal in them. And maybe other reasons, and you don't want to just go through and compute the entire, you know, the eigen decomposition. So this is going to give us a way of essentially saving some computational time. Again, we're using EM, so we can deal with missing data, uh, uh, missing values in the data set. We can do mixtures of probabilistic models, right, in a principled way. So I'm sure you could come up with some way of doing that, you know, a heuristic way from the old approach. But now, you know, when we've got, PC, when we've got this probabilistic approach, we can actually think about things in a more principled way. Like, how should we combine these models? What does the resulting mo probabilistic model look like? Does it make sense? It's one of the real advantages of this approach. Um, it forms the basis for a Bayesian treatment of PCA in which the dimensionality of the principal subspace can be found automatically, right? So remember in the previous settings, we always had to guess. We said, okay, well, give me the first, the second, you know, the third, and maybe you look for like elbows in some, you know, reconstruction plot. But again, this is, you know, we can view this as doing Bayesian model selection and just, and we can automatically determine, you know, how large a subspace should be um, by balancing model complexity with this kind of explanatory power, basically. Okay, um, the existence of a likelihood function allows direct comparison with other probabilistic density models. So conventional PCA will assign a low reconstruction cost to data points that are close to the principal subspace, even if they lie arbitrarily far from the, tra from the training set. So the yeah, basic idea is that, uh, let me just erase this. So the basic idea is that, you know, if you've got, if you figured out this is your training, your, your, your principal subspace, if you have points that are kind of lying all the way out here, um, 
Well, uh, the conventional PCA isn't going to, you're, you're not going to penalize these at all because they're, they're living on that subspace. Remember, what mattered was how much, how much you were off of the subspace. You can have points way out of infinity and, and your data might say, that's a great model. You might have a great model of the data. You, you want to kind of be influenced by these or at least kind of evaluate um, you know, that these are outliers. And with conventional PCA, it might not be possible to do that. And so we're going to see that, um, that we'll actually be able to, uh, we'll, we'll actually be able to, you know, mark these points as perhaps outliers. I assume that's kind of what he's getting at, that we're going to, you know, be influenced in the correct way by these points out there rather than kind of giving them, you know, zero, zero reconstruction cost, which is probably what, what you don't want. Um, probabilistic PCA can be used to model class conditional densities and hence be applied to classification problems. So you can, you know, effectively you, you, you take your data, you condition on it having one label or the other, um, and then you can do PCA on that. I don't know why you wouldn't be able to do this with the existing approach, so I guess we'll see. And it can be run generatively, so this is kind of one of the really cool aspects of this approach, right? So, you know, in the previous two versions, we we're just going from, we we're going from the data to a low dimensional representation, whatever it was. There's no real way of going back. Whereas with this generative approach, with the approach, the probabilistic approach here, uh, that generative approach is like the heart of the heart of it. And so what you can do, one, you know, one thing you can do with that is once you've fitted your model, you can generate data from it in the original space, in your data space. And then you can look and say, well, is this model, does it look like is my generative data looking like um, you know, what uh, my actual data looks like? And that can just be one easy way of just checking um, that, okay, your fit was okay. So that's kind of one, one use of it. Okay, so lots of reasons why we want to be looking at um, this algorithm and others this way. And another reason, which I think he doesn't quite uh, mention here, but is that you can then extend, you can change your assumptions about the latent variables and come up with a whole you know, families of, of algorithms. Like we'll talk about factor analysis later, which corresponds to you know, a version of that. So you don't have to remember all of these like different, you know, the, the different algorithms in isolation. You can just see them as being, you know, as all being variants of kind of the same idea. And so that's just even good for your own kind of keeping things straight in your head. Okay. So let's let's start. So okay, so probabilistic PCA is a simple example of the linear Gaussian framework in which all of the marginal and conditional distributions are Gaussian. Okay, so it's essentially gonna be the simplest setting that we're ever gonna get. Now we can reformulate probabilistic PCA by first introducing an explicit latent variable Z corresponding to the principal component subspace. And then we define a Gaussian prior distribution over P of Z, so that's where the probabilistic aspect is coming in together with the Gaussian conditional distribution P of X given Z for the observed variable, right? So we were observing X, and now we're introducing these latent variables, and then we're relating the two. Specifically, the prior distribution is given by zero mean unit covariance Gaussian, so it comes the simplest possible setting, and the conditional distribution of the observed variable X um, also has a very simple form, right? You take Z, you do some linear operation on it, add a mean, and you add a bit of noise on top. And notice that this factorizes with respect to the elements of X. In other words, it's an example of a naive Bayes model. So it's a model where the observations given the latents are independent. And the question is, you know, why another, you know, why would you want to do something like this? And one of the key reasons is that essentially what you're saying, you're 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 simplifying the correlation structure of your data, right? So essentially you're saying, look, let's zoom in for a bit. We'll see a picture of that in a second, but you know, let's say your data is kind of coming in like this. So it's got some correlation structure. Uh, you know, going here, of course. Essentially, you're saying, look, this correlation structure can, you know, make makes things dependent on each other, right? And whenever there's dependence, things can become hard to uh, can become hard to work with, etc. So essentially, what you're saying is, look, this correlation structure is actually produced by through a combination of there is a kind of an uncorrelated latent variable. And then a transformation, a fixed transformation of that latent variable, um, which then produces the observations and condition on which the observations are independent, right? So again, look, you've got la latents that are independent in, in, in the setting, and then you've got, you've got observations that are conditionally independent. They're not marginally independent because, you know, obviously P of X has correlation structure, but you're now using these latent variables to, to kind of, you're essentially just positing some latent variables that make your data conditionally independent. So you're kind of splitting up your, your, your um, decomposing your correlation, your, your correlation structure, um, 
into ways that can a make it make your data more tractable to work with, but can actually you know maybe perhaps actually reveal the underlying generative process, the actual process that produced your data. So it's kind of all about like you know showing these correlations. We're going to see a picture of it in a sec. Um, showing that these correlations are can be produced from essentially uncorrelated independent data that's transformed in, in a certain way. Okay. As we shall see, the, the columns of W span a linear subspace within the data space that corresponds to the principal subspace. You might have guessed that already. The other parameter in this model is the scalar sigma squared governing the variance of the conditional distribution. All right, and so one final point is before we get into this, this figure is uh, that loss of generality in assuming a zero mean unit covariance Gaussian for the latent variable distribution because a more general Gaussian distribution would give rise to an equivalent probabilistic model. So I think all, he, all he's saying here is that, like, look, here, you're, you're assuming a simple model. Well, if you had some mean and some covariance, and there's actually an exercise on this worth doing, let's say we change this to zero to some mean and some, you know, arbitrary covariance. Well, you could then actually fold those into your W and into your mu and, and still end up and still um, use um, a, a latent variable that was um, that was you know zero mean and unit covariance. So essentially like any structure that you add here, you could actually just move into the observation model. And so you might as well just keep it in the observation model and keep your keep your um, your latent variable distribution as simple as possible. So I think that's all he's saying. There's no loss of generality by assuming this form. Okay. All right, so let's um, when is it good? Yeah, okay, let's, let's go talk about this, this section first and then we'll look at the picture. Okay, so we can view the probabilistic PCA model from a generative viewpoint in which a sampled value of the observed, of the observed variables, the x's, is obtained by first choosing a value for the latent variable, z, so we sample z from its distribution, and then sampling the observed variable conditioned on this latent value, right? So like here is essentially what it would look like. So you would pick your z from that Gaussian distribution, you would multiply it by w, add the mean, and then add some noise on top. So m-dimensional Gaussian latent variable, blah, blah. This generative process is illustrated in figure 12.9, and this framework is based on a mapping from latent space to data space. Okay, so we're going from, which is what we're previously we're going from in the other direction. The reverse mapping from data space to latent space will be talked about shortly. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Okay, so let's have a look at this. And in the, in the first, let's just start with, you know, the marginal distribution here. This is like the P of X, and you've got a mean. So this, your data arrives with some correlations. And so now what you're going to do is you're going to say, look, these correlations are actually produced. The way we get these correlations is, there we go, let me zoom out. Yeah, okay, even more. So essentially what we do is, we have some, in this case, let's say a, a one-dimensional um, latent variable, and we just pick an element from it, and then we transform it using this w vector, because it's just, we have this, just this uh, one-dimensional, it'll just be a single uh, a vector. And so we're gonna get points now along, along this line, and we're going to have some density of those points, right, just inherited from here. So we're gonna have maybe, I don't know, like some, something like that. And now for that point, we just add a little bit of noise. And when you essentially kind of, he's going to talk about it as a spray can, which I think is a nice way of thinking about it. You essentially are just kind of doing a little spray can operation along this line, but with weighted according to this. And that's where this correlation comes from. So I think that's kind of a really, really interesting, really key intuition for like why all this stuff is really important. Like you're, you're essentially decomposing this correlation into just, okay, some simple latent variable, a fixed transformation, and then just some, again, simple isotropic noise on top of that. Um, which I think is, 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 you know, pretty cool. Okay. So let's make sure everything's aligned. Terrific. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So now we're going to, okay, suppose we wish to determine the values of the parameters W, mu, and sigma squared using maximum likelihood. Okay. So we need, we need an expression for the marginal distribution of X of the observed variables. And of course, some in product rules of probability, we're going to integrate out um, the latent variable. And again, because we're living in this linear Gaussian model, life is very uh, simple for us. So we're just going to get a Gaussian distribution that comes out of it. Um, and it's just a simple way to see that, you know, if, if you know that everything's going to be Gaussian, you can just say, well, all I need to know is figure out what the mean of the Gaussian is and what's the covariance. And so, well, we know the mean. So this is, so this thing here is, of course, x. And so, well, x is wz plus mu plus epsilon. Well, this has mean zero. 
z is mean zero. So this goes, this goes, all you get is the mu. And then you have the covariance. So the covariance of something um, is going to be is, uh, yeah, so this is, yeah, I was, just, I was just a little bit confused here, but this, this is x minus mu, right? So the mean subtracted, uh, the mean subtracted stuff. Um, and, and you just, so this is the expectation of x minus mu times the x minus mu transpose, and you multiply it all out. And the only thing that contributes is this WW transpose coming from the latent variable, and then this uh, coming from the, uh, the additive noise, right? Because the mu has no covariance, so the covariance only comes from these two places. So very simple, you can just immediately write that down. Reviews the fact that z and epsilon are independent random variables and hence are uncorrelated. So we don't have to kind of talk about you know, how these, this guy interacts with that guy because they're, um, they are uncorrelated. So here's a kind of intuitive picture. We can think of the distribution P of X as being defined by taking an isotropic Gaussian spray can. So that was, those were like the red, the red circles and moving it across the principal subspace, spraying Gaussian ink with density uh, determined by sigma squared and weighted by the prior distribution. Um, in, that was the, the, the Gaussian Z. The accumulated ink density gives rise to a pancake shaped distribution representing the marginal density P of X. So this is essentially like the key, you know, a key intuition. Okay, the predictive distribution is governed by the parameters mu, w, and sigma squared. But there is redundancy in this parameterization corresponding to rotations of the latent space coordinates, right? Okay, so this is, this is an important point, so let's... And it's easy to see. So consider a matrix w tilde, which is w times some rotation. Using the orthogonality property, we see that the quantity w tilde, w tilde, that's going to come up in this covariance, is going to be the same as before, right? So there's going to be some redundancy. If we use that rotated version of latent variables, we get the same distribution over our observations. Thus, there's a whole family of matrices, all of which give rise to the same predictive distribution. This invariance can be understood in terms of rotation within the latent space, and we're going to talk about it later. Okay, and then finally, uh, so when we evaluate the predictive distribution, we require C minus 1. So um, where is that? Come? Yeah, this is over here. Um, right, so this was going to be, no, this was like the, are the covariance of our observations. So if we want to like evaluate it, you know, when you have, you're going to have that sigma minus one term showing up in, um, in the Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian. So we want to have to evaluate this thing as D by D, right? And D could be very large. So do we need to invert this thing? But it turns out that uh, we can, we can, the computation required to do this can be viewed by making, by reduced, by using the matrix inversion identity. So have a look at this. If you don't know about it, it's very useful. And so we actually write this inverse. We essentially convert it into an M by M, where M is the number of your, um, your data points. And M is going to be closely related to W. It's kind of some dual to it. And because we invert M rather than inverting C, so there's no inversion of W anymore, we just write it in terms of inverting M. The cost of evaluating C minus 1 is reduced from OD cubed to OM cubed. So there's going to be huge savings in high dimensional spaces. I'm going to actually highlight that. This is really, really important. Okay, so, and uh, I, I even used this property, I think, just the other day in work, and it made my algorithm a lot faster. So definitely use this. Okay, as well as the predictive distribution, we will also require the posterior distribution, which can, again, be written down directly, again, using our Gaussian identities, um, just like this. And again, no, notice that the posterior mean depends on x, right? So x is showing up here, with posterior covariance is independent of x, just like, um, yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. So I think I think that's about it. And next time we're going to talk about maximum likelihood um, for uh, for PCA. So given this model, but I hope this kind of gives you a sense of this uh, you know this probabilistic view of PCA and generally kind of the latent variable approach to capturing capturing data and you know why we do that. We're trying to break down correlations into being produced by latent variables in simple ways, with, maybe with like fixed transformations that do most of the work for us. Um, yeah, so hopefully, you know, as we go through this chapter, you'll get a, get a better sense of why it's useful, um, why we want to think about the problem this way. So hopefully you will join me next time when we talk about maximum likelihood PCA. Talk to you then. Bye.